Welcome to the Seller Roundtable e-commerce coaching and business strategies with Andy Arnott and Amy Wees. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Andy Arnott with Amy Wees. And this is Seller Roundtable number 102. We have Adam Epstein here today. Adam, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. Very excited. So Adam, uh, we always like to start out with uh, getting to know our guests a little bit better. If you could give us some background, uh, go as deep as you want to in terms of your journey to where you are today, you know, maybe where you grew up, maybe where you're born, school, work, hard knocks, you know, anything that you want to you want to fill us in on. Sure. Uh, I was born and raised in Los Angeles and recently moved back a few years ago. Uh, my career has been in finance through and through. I'm kind of that boring guy that went through two years of investment banking and then went into two years of investing, uh, went back to business school, did some private equity, um, and really got the entrepreneurial itch when I was at business school. Um, started talking with some classmates, thinking about ideas, ultimately went back into finance afterwards, but continued to have that the desire to try a startup. Um, and as I was looking for new opportunities, um, found our two co-founders at Boosted Commerce through a headhunter, um, talked with them and, and really fell in love with the idea. Um, in particular, as we think about this role, I am our head of M&A. Um, there's not too many startups where you have the ability to grow inorganically uh, on, in addition to the organic growth and kind of use my investing acumen um, within a startup you know, spot. So was super excited about the role. Um, the company was started about a year ago. I joined shortly thereafter. Um, and we've been rocking and rolling ever since. Awesome. So if you could, uh, j you know, give people kind of a uh, macro view on, um, you know, kind of the process, like say there's a seller like, hey, I just hit seven figures. I want to sell my business. You know, what's that process look like in terms of uh, approaching you guys? Yeah. Uh, so we, we see businesses from all different types of angles, all different types of places. Um, there's obviously brokers out there in the space and brokers certainly have their um, their place within the Amazon ecosystem and we'll, we'll see deals from them. But we also have people reaching out to, to us directly um, and us doing some outbound you know, research as well. Um, so really all three of those tools are, are different ways to get in contact with us. Um, we have emails, acquisition at boosted.com. You can go to our website, boostedcommerce.com. There's some free form, uh, free file forms to fill out in terms of some overview on your business so we can get an understanding. Um, from there, we'll typically have a, a very short introduction call to make sure the business fits with us, then probably one more deeper call to really dive in, ask for some data requests. Um, pretty quickly after that, we will provide you with an indication of what we think your business, you know, the value of your business. Um, if it makes sense and both sides get to an agreement from there, it's a 30 to 45 day ish period of diving in a lot deeper on due diligence, making sure we really understand the business. So when we transition, there's no issues, no concerns, and it kind of continues with the stability and the growth that you have. Um, part of that is legal documentation. And then after that 45 days, you transfer the business to us, we transfer you the money. Um, there's a, usually a short period where we kind of have a transition in terms of you helping us continue to run the business to make sure we fully understand it. Um, and then you're sitting on the beach drinking a margarita while we're working for you and making you some more money. So, um, so, so in terms, it sounds like you, uh, you know, as part of the deal, the original owner keeps some percentage of the business. Is that correct? They get some, uh, get to, uh, retain some equity. Is that a discussion? Like, how does that kind of work? Yeah, it's usually not equity. What we have is an earnout, right? So it's actually um, limits the downside as, as the further seller doesn't actually have to put any more money in the business, even if anything were to happen, but participates in the upside. So assuming we continue to grow the business, like I, I said, we're, we're working for you guys for, for a little bit, you being the seller, um, as you know, you'll continue to earn money as, as we earn money as well. Interesting. So uh, give me, uh, you know, going back to my example. So I come to you, I've got a million dollars, you know, seven figure uh, Amazon business, you know, say I'm, I'm, you know, netting 30%. Um, you know, and I come to you, I say, Hey, I want to, you know, sell my business. Uh, I, I know the terms are going to be different. So this isn't, you know, I'm going to preempt this with like, you know, don't expect this, you know, for every business guys, but just a, an overall example, you know, uh, what would the equity uh, payout kind of look like, you know, uh, you know, is there, you know, what's the, what's the average multiple, you know, kind of things like that. 
Yeah, uh, it, there's obviously a lot more than just margins and size, right? They, we have kind of a criteria we go through, including what industry are you in? What does the competitive landscape look like? Um, are you a leader in the category? Do you have a review mode? How long have you been there in terms of history associated with the business? You know, what is your product diversification or con concentration look like? Um, what is your mix of organic versus inorga inorganic growth and how much PPC are you spending? Um, you know, the, just to name a few, there, there's a bunch of different aspects that go into it. So it, it's tough to give a, an exact number. Um, what we're typically seeing at the moment is multiples kind of in the, the three to mid four range for most businesses of that size. Um, those tick up a little bit and that's kind of a combination of cash up front um, the earn out or component, which we just talked about. And then the third component is usually either a seller note where the seller provides, you know, quote unquote debt to the business in order to continue to, to push forward or what we call a stability payment where given some of the COVID bump, um, what we'll say is, Hey, we, we want to give you credit for all of that growth. Um, but we also want to make sure that the growth maintains, right? So if you can even just keep it flat, not even, we don't need to grow the business for that stability, but just keep it flat. Um, we'll pay you for, you know, the size of the business with an extra X amount or X percent of, of the overall purchase price. Awesome. So um, I assume that, you know, you, you probably get quite a few businesses coming through the door. You know, you, you probably, you know, take on some, don't take on others. What I'm curious though, without, you know, giving away any, any clients info, which I know you would never do. Uh, what are maybe like three things that you are maybe in common that are, that you see in businesses that are really strong and successful and maybe three that, you know, that you see a lot of, you know, maybe the three biggest mistakes or three biggest issues that you see from uh, companies that, you know, are, 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 are maybe not the, the best fit for you guys or just, uh, you know, uh, not being super successful with Amazon? Sure. Um, it, it's all dependent, right? I think every, every buyer has something different that they look for. One thing that we are typically looking for, <coughs> excuse me, is a, <coughs> sorry about that, um, is no a hero skew. So we're, we're looking for one kind of, or a couple um, that really drive the business, right? So when we look at our business model, we're looking to put together a portfolio of different businesses. And, and at that size, if you have a hero skew, it's a little bit easier for us to um, grow, to understand, to operate, right? If you have a hundred SKUs doing a million dollars, a little bit harder to understand how that works. Where if you have four SKUs and three of them are doing 900 of that a million, and we can really understand those SKUs, we can understand where they are and, and help. So our diversification typically comes across the portfolio where we're looking for a little bit more concentration at a deal that size, right? As we scale up, it becomes a little bit different. Um, but that, that's one thing that we're certainly looking for. Um, the other thing, which I think is very important is, is rankings and reviews, right? We like to call it a review mode. How do you stand out versus your competition? Um, it's not anything that's that new or that crazy, um, but you know, if you're showing up in the first, the top five on certain keywords within your category, that Fifth Avenue real estate is obviously worth a lot more than showing up on the second page where most people aren't scrolling there. So how do you get to the first page and how do you maintain that? Um, you know, it, it's quite hard to get up there, but once you're up there, it's actually a lot easier to stay there given the, the you know, cycle of, of Amazon and kind of getting into that, that natural cycle. Um, so those are two things that you know, we're always looking at the third one, I think would be margins. Um, as we kind of look at businesses, we typically like to see businesses of 20% plus margins. Um, obviously, again, depends on the category. If you go into supplements, those get even higher. Um, there's others that are kind of closer to the teens, makes sense. But having, you know, if, if you're putting a dollar of revenue into Amazon and Amazon's taking a decent amount uh, because of their FBA fees and their marketplace fee, et cetera, you want a little bit of wiggle room. So you're not, you know, doing all this work to get to get pennies on a dollar on, on the on the end and then there's not a lot of room if something goes wrong on that margin um so you know 20 percent margins is kind of our our baseline um for the right companies we'll, we'll look at changing that around but those, those are three things in particular to think about um from a very high level um on the other side of things there's two kind of things that that really stand out um one is stockouts right i think Stockouts, everybody has them in particular in times like 2020, when you're growing like a weed and you have no idea um, how to forecast because your forecast from last month has been quadrupled or quintupled. Um, but having stockouts are um, 
pluses and minuses, right? But when we look at a business, it's a plus in that, okay, if that stock out wasn't there, it actually lives up some additional room and upside. On the minus and things do stock out, um, your ranking can go down pretty quickly because as, as I mentioned, it's easy to stay in that top five. So you have people gunning for that top five and, and we'll, we'll take over your, your spot fairly fast. Um, and then you, what we have at, at Boosted is called the return to glory SOP and in ways that you have to kind of get back up to the top when that happens. Um, associated with that is also delistings, right? And, and some delistings you can't help and that's the nature of Amazon. Some of them you're gonna have some black hat activities where people will attack you. Um, but having ways to minimize the listings and having SOPs to get it back up as quickly as possible is, is huge because that, you know, the two ways you're not going to sell on Amazon are, are stockouts and delistings. Um, so that's, you know, th those are two things where we see them in the numbers. Um, obviously people want to buy growing businesses. People want to buy profitable businesses. And, and those are a couple things that overall are heard, uh, fairly common. Yeah. Um, I, I, just from my own experience, you know, I, I, I've been doing this since uh, 2012 and, you know, I was one of those people who, who scaled quickly and, you know, at one point we were up over 800 SKUs. Um, and uh, in retrospect, one of the biggest mistakes we made was doing that, right? If we would have just stayed really tight in terms of, you know, maybe 10 to 20 SKUs, um, you know, that would have been, you know, I think a lot, uh, a lot easier to manage, right? The more SKUs you add, the more, the harder it is to manage. A lot of people don't realize that. Um, so, you know, scaling quick is a great thing, but, you know, unless you have, you know, stuff in place to be able to manage that kind of growth, um, it, it, it's actually going to be a, a, a detriment in, in a lot of ways. Um, I'm curious to know, you know, how important is, is brand to you? So if somebody comes to you um, and, you know, they're, they're not really well known, but they're doing a ton of business on Amazon, which is actually kind of common uh, these days, you know, do you care if they have a really strong brand outside of Amazon or is it all, you know, you're just looking at the numbers for the most part? Uh, it's somewhere in between there to tell you the truth, right? So we, we are building up a portfolio of businesses, as I mentioned before, not every single product we're going to buy or brand we're going to buy, we're expecting to take off of Amazon, right? There are some products that are meant to be on Amazon as well. There's other products where we're looking at it and there's brand potential beyond, right? Ultimately, we want to be where the consumer is. Um, right now, obviously, Amazon is that spot doing 50% of e-commerce business and e-commerce business continues to grow at a tremendous pace, uh, which was only accelerated by COVID. Um, but where else are consumers going, right? Walmart is on its way up, so that's a super interesting opportunity. Um, Shopify has grown in an enormous way over the last few years, and it used to be WooCommerce, and now everybody's talking about Shopify, right? But having your own DTC site, um, but not every brand's meant to have a DTC site. So it all kind of plays into valuation, how we underwrite a business, what we're thinking about. Um, there are certainly businesses on Amazon where if you have that review mode, you're up at number one. You know, most people on Amazon, I think the last stat I saw, stat I saw was 80% are searching for a product. They're not searching for a brand name, right? So if you're searching for soap, you're going into search for soap, you're not searching Dove. Um, so from that perspective, Amazon is not as important as either having a brand for a DTC perspective. Um, but you still want, you know, some, I, I think that goes into review mode and what kind of reviews you have. And, and that in itself is almost a branding on Amazon, right? Because there's not too many places outside a marketplace where all of your comp competitors are lined up and you have 27 straight pages of soap. How are you going to stand out there, right? Brand name is one. If that's not going to work, you need to be at the top of the rankings and you need to have reviews. So somebody's going to come and say, okay, this has been validated by, by the Amazon community, the Amazon ecosystem. Um, and that's part of why Amazon gets the fees they do for having the billions of eyeballs that can see your product. Right. So I'm really interested in the overall opportunity what you, you know, your background is in finance, right? It's not necessarily in the e-commerce um, space as far as being a seller. And I'm curious what you think about the opportunity to quickly grow and sell a company in e-commerce today. Do you think that, you know, despite the 3,800 new sellers coming in every day, the, that, you know, the, what is it, 85 or something percentage failure rate that Jeff Bezos admitted in front of Congress, you know, um, what do you think about the opportunity? Are you still seeing some massive, um, beautiful exits? Are you still seeing people really scale quickly and 
Uh, do you think it's it's still just a really great opportunity, or is it kind of equalized for other as compared to to other um, income streams and opportunities? Yeah, um, from a I can give you, uh, qualify that from both a buyer and a seller perspective, right? So. My background, while in investing, I, I've been doing consumer investing for a long time, um, traditionally more brick and mortar, and have kind of moved towards e-commerce. Um, what Amazon has been able to do for mom and pop sellers is beyond incredible, um, right? I, I, we talk to sellers all day long. We've probably talked to over a thousand in the last year or seen a thousand businesses. Um, and you know, people have told us they learn from YouTube or they learn from, from blogs just like this or channel channels. Um, and that's, that's incredible to me. Um, that used to not be the case. And, and why is that able, why are you able to do that? Because, you know, as a one person show, you can now create a multi-million dollar business fairly easily with the infrastructure, the infrastructure that Amazon set up. Um, so the, the opportunity is tremendous. There's never really been a better time to be a, a e-commerce seller. Um, there's more and more people doing it, but there's also more and more opportunity as everything moves that way. You have, you know, aggregators or investors similar to boosted commerce who are looking for ways to roll this up and are paying a nice, you know, multiple to, to be able to get things where there is a product market fit already. Um, and from the seller perspective, you know, there's, there's certainly sellers who love starting new things. Um, and don't want to deal with the hassle of scaling it to the next level or don't know how or just have plugged all their money back into working capital. Once you've kind of reached that level now, there, there's a tremendous payday on, on the back end, right? So um, yes, there is a, a decent you know, fail rate uh, that, that you just mentioned, Amy, but there's also a, a tremendous opportunity and there's not really many other places where you can you know, work some people as little as three to four hours a week um, build up a million plus dollar business, really just kind of finding a, a nice product market fit, bringing it to Amazon and getting your goods in, into a FBA warehouse. And then, you know, a little bit of marketing and, and you're right there. Um, it, it's fascinating what, what Amazon has been able to do and other marketplaces have been able to do for, for mom and pop businesses. Yeah. I love that perspective. Um, it's, it is still a great opportunity. And when you compare it to what you would have to do traditionally to grow a business of that size in that time frame and the team that you would need, it is, there's a, a big difference there. So I would agree on, on that side of, of the opportunity, definitely. So let's talk a little bit about business value. Everyone wants to know, you know, well, okay, for example, you know, uh, we, we run a lot of our expenses through our Amazon business. It's kind of nice, right? We can, we can write off like our, our, some of our house stuff because our office is in the house. We can write off our truck payment because we use that, you know, to move stuff around, that kind of stuff. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of people do that. They'll run their personal expenses through their business, that kind of thing, um, you know, business expenses, of course. But, uh, but either way, let's talk about how a business's value for an Amazon type of business is calculated because not all of those expenses are taken out of that margin that you talked about. And you talked about a 20% margin. Are we talking about before advertising, after advertising, or is that what you're looking for them to net? Um, so can we talk a little bit about how a business is valued and what sellers should be looking for um, when they're looking at their books with their yep. accountant and, and what they should be thinking about? Yeah, so the, the first thing I would say um, is at Boosted Commerce, we, we have expertise in digging into any type of financial set we get, right? So we can, we can take your numbers directly off Amazon and, and use those to kind of create our own P&L. We can even take... You know, just give us your data and we'll figure out how to put it together, um, which is great. That being said, not only from a selling perspective, but just general business practices, having your, your numbers in, in working order makes everything so much easier, both from an analytics perspective, but also just, just managing your business, right? So it, it's worthwhile to get that set up. Um, when we think about it, we're looking at what we call either SDE, seller's discretionary earnings, or as it gets bigger, it's EBITDA. And both of those are essentially a proxy for cash flow or profit, right? How much money is your business making on any given time period? 
Um, now, what we're looking is for recurring profit. So as you're talking about, Amy, in terms of, uh, you know, office space or, you know, you're putting your own car through it because it's a business expense where you're traveling all over, those are what we call addbacks. So if you look at your number and then there's some, some costs that as a boosted commerce or another aggregator or another buyer, those aren't going to be continued costs. You'll get credit added those back to your numbers. So that will actually make your profit a little bit higher than your actual profit, because what we care about is future cash flows, right? We're looking at what can we make on this business and we don't have a car. We already have our office. We even sometimes have, you know, if you're looking at a jungle scout or some, some costs like that, which aren't as large, but we can, we can add those back um, to give you credit because we're looking at what, at what we're going to be doing. So when I say 20% margins, I'm, I'm talking about that adjusted seller's discretionary earnings or EBITDA, um, which is, for every dollar that you make in revenue, you're getting 20 cents of quote unquote cash flow. Got it. That makes sense. So, um, in terms of selling, though, and in terms of seller fees, I know there are many different types of buyers. We have aggregators, we have individual buyers. You can post your business on um, business websites like Empire Flippers. You know, there's many different types of businesses out there. Um, and types of buyers out there. So in terms of that, like how, how would you compare Boosted? If we can explain a little bit about what, what type of buyer Boosted is and kind of compare that to some of the other types of buyers out there and then talk about how much it costs to sell. There's obviously going to be some fees or something like that associated with that sale. Um, can we talk about that? Sure. Um, so the industry is changing at a dramatic, dramatic pace, right? From a, from a buyer's perspective, it kind of reminds me of, of private equity back in the 1980s. And this is getting off of, of Amazon speak, but, you know, back then the industry was incredibly nascent as it is here, but there's still a decent amount of infrastructure in place. So it's, it's just evolving at a rapid, rapid pace, which is only made more rapid by what's happened with COVID over the last year. Um, so from that perspective, you know, you, you typically, Amazon was, it wasn't really wasn't set up for, for buying and selling companies, but it's kind of evolved from, from the aspect of um, people like Boosted Commerce coming in. So you have multiple different aggregators um, who have raised a decent amount of money to come in and buy up businesses and add scale. And when I say that, right, what we always tell our sellers is, okay, they say, shoot, I wish I would have had an additional 15 hours this week to do X, Y, Z. Well, we have a team of operators behind us um, who, once we buy the business, we can actually give that additional TLC to your business to, to help scale it, right? Not only the, the time, but also expertise because we have, uh, you know, the boosted brain is what we call it. So we have a team that sits kind of at corporate and we have a supply chain team and we have an inventory management team and we have a marketing team that all allows us to spread it across multiple different businesses. Whereas one business, it's harder to have all that infrastructure in place. Um, so that's kind of where the, the aggregator model comes from. Um, boosted commerce, we like to think of ourselves more, of the, more, of, more than just an aggregator, right? We're trying to be where the consumer is. So how do we take that and, and scale? Um, that, that's a different question. Um, so that, that's kind of one set of buyers. And typically those buyers can pay a little bit more than others who are buying on a one-off basis because they, they can drive more value out of your business, right? Because of that team they have, there's additional growth that they have, there's additional levers um, potentially even moving it off Amazon or into Europe because we have expertise there, et cetera. Um, you have individual buyers, right, which have been around for a while um, who can go buy businesses, you know, and are kind of just continuing on with the mom and pop way um, who will, will take your business and continue to run in a similar manner, but are looking again for that product market fit so they don't have to start something from scratch and get through that point. You were talking about it earlier, Amy, where, you know, a certain percentage of businesses aren't going to make it to a million dollars. Um, I know the numbers you were throwing out earlier, the number we see is there's somewhere between 40 and 50,000 businesses on Amazon doing over a million dollars of revenue, right? So it, it's still a decent size, but it, it's not that easy to get to that size. So some people are looking to buy their way in even as an individual. Um, and then what you also have seen is Amazon businesses continue to get larger. Some of the private equity type investors are also coming into the space. Um, in particular for, for larger ones, right? So we're not now talking about a million dollars of revenue. We're talking about eight or even nine figures of revenue, $100 million, where 
Amazon has attracted a lot of attention recently, um, given some of the success and given how, you know, how well the business has done. Um, so those are kind of the three main buyers we're seeing. Um, you know, there's different aspects to each um, and there's different benefits and different issues with each. Um, you know, what, what we're trying to do is build up a portfolio of 100 plus, 200 plus brands, um, become the, the Johnson or Johnson or Procter & Gamble of the 21st century, have an opportunity to have all these brands and, and benefit from the boosted brain while maintaining the integrity of the brands themselves and hopefully helping them scale. Thanks for tuning in to part one of this episode. Join us every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for live Q&A and bonus content after the recording at sellerroundtable.com. Sponsored by the ultimate software tool for Amazon sales and growth, sellerseo.com and amazingathome.com.